Well, Robert, I'll just start off by saying thank you for being here. And um, I, I understand that you do congressional hearings from time to time. This is not going to be that. They told me I had set a record <laughs> for a commissioner of congressional hearings. And is that a good not, record? It is not a good sign. No. Okay. Not the one you aspire to. Congressional hearings do not occur to congratulate you on the excellent job that you're doing. <laughs> Well, I, I would like to congratulate you and thank you on behalf of everybody here. And as you know, this is a, quite a diverse assembly of people who care about healthcare data. And so I thought we would just uh, leap right in. And you have been a pioneer in the use of real world data, RWD as it's called. And I don't know if pushing is the right word, advocating for it to be incorporated into evidence generation. So nobody better than you to tell us what is your assessment of the progress we've made and what happens next? Well, um, I think a lot of people in this room know it, but I, you know, I had the curse of being infected with real world data enjoyment as a medical student in 1977. Um, at a time when, you know, 100% of doctors' records then were hand scribbled mm -hmm. and the medical records uh, was like a fortress of all these things stacked up on each other. But we had a little computer system at Duke that uh, my mentor, Eugene Stead, had started. And actually, even today, as I look back, I haven't seen anything that compares to the system we had. Oh, wow. Uh, circa 1980 to 1983. But Why it didn't was you commercialize it? Well, I was going to get to that. <laughs> okay. So, um, but it was in one particular area. It was an area of cardiology for inpatients, starting with inpatients, where uh, there was a boss that had complete control of the people inputting data. And so, literally, we would see patients. The the um, electronic data system was the medical record, mm -hmm. and he had the insight to know that in a disease like heart disease, actually I would say almost all diseases, the really important data was the follow-up afterwards. So we followed people for life. It was all integrated and I could sit down with patients and say, um, we're gonna recommend, uh, let's say bypass surgery. Here's what you can expect compared to if you got medical treatment. Mm -hmm. That was uh, right when the Cox model first came out. Mm -hmm. So we're able to display the data. Um, so it all, and so uh, they, tr they tried to commercialize that system and it failed because to, to work in the clunky computing environment that existed then, you needed to be able to tell the employees and faculty, you will enter the data or yeah. you get fired. Um, it's hard. So all of the experiments outside of that one institution failed. But I saw the promise then and it's been a lifelong quest with many ups and downs. And as I think the question really refers to, we emphasized this in 2016 uh, at the FDA. And I would say, if, I, if you look at it, a lot of progress has been made. Um, but of course, what's frustrating is it only gives you a glimpse of what's possible. Mm -hmm. And we're still, in terms of absolute uh, results, we're still a long ways away. But I think um, the different streams of progress are occurring in a way which is going to lead to um, synergy that, you, you know, although there's a lot to be done, it's going to happen much faster now. I think we're in the rapid uptake phase. What have been the major obstacles to more progress? Um, well, I would say in the past, the fundamental infrastructure of computing has been a problem. And, um, you know, we were just chatting. I worked at Alphabet uh, the, in, in between my FDA stints, and it was amazing to see um, engineers that had conquered all sorts of other things, um, you know, with great um, ego strength, you know, get into healthcare <laughs> and then get uh, go running back down the hill and retreat. Do something so else. like the Russians right <laughs> yeah. now. Um, but um, I so I, but I think. Computing is just absolutely not the issue now. Right. It's really uh, culture and ethics that are the um, issues. And there's a, and when I say culture, I don't just mean like the indigenous culture. I also mean the way the regulations and interactions work that keep people from doing what they know they can do in the first place. Mm -hmm. 
So what do you see as the way forward? You mentioned synergies and a lot of these streams coming together. So what happens next? Well, um, I can tell you what we're thinking about at the FDA and having many, many discussions now. And I'll admit I'm a couple of months behind because this, these things called infant formula and tobacco regulation <laughs> seem to have eaten up the entire summer. Sure. Um, but but we're, uh, we're, we're going now. And um, I would say um, just this morning I was on a call. There are like 25 streams of people. I think there's very little disagreement about technically and um, uh, in, organizationally, purposefully, what needs to happen. Um, but the financial incentives are very adverse to doing what really needs to happen. This is just my opinion, of course. And um, As in no upside and unlimited downside? Or what's, what's wrong with the financial incentives? I think what's fundamentally wrong, and, and I'll just, the analogy I'll use is clinical research. People keep saying, why don't we fix clinical research? And we're going to work. It's valiant to try to fix clinical research. We're working hard on it. But it's hard to fix clinical research in a country where the healthcare system is fundamentally not fit for purpose right. of what it's supposed to be doing. And the problem that I see is what's called suboptimization. That is, each of our, in America, for whatever reason, we've set up a system where we spend $4.1 trillion in every component of the system is highly incentivized to build a fortress around its activities, hoard the data for um, because it's power, um, and optimize its own functionality. And what suboptimization refers to is that um, is when the whole is a lot less than the sum of the parts. Each group is incentivizing its own use, and the, the, although we all talk about patient centricity, the system as a whole is exactly the opposite. Mm. It's the least patient-centric thing <laughs> you could possibly imagine. Um, because we're all selling our own wares. Now, let's get back to FDA for a minute, though. Um, at least in the field of research, industry developing medical products funds about 70% of clinical research globally. And if we, um, at least that was data from the last time it was measured about five years ago, I think, by Moses and colleagues. And I think now if you throw in the big foundations like Welcome and um, Gates Foundation, you know, that's going to account for the vast majority of funding. NIH has a big role. Um, and I think everybody in the datafied, regulated research space would say that um, while the leadership of FDA has gotten it, we haven't necessarily filtered that down to practical guidance that can spring loose the potential that's now in play when it comes to using real world data and converting it to um, reliable evidence. Mm -hmm. That's where I say, I think we really know what to do now, but we've got to sort of get all of our ducks in a row on the regulatory side and then hopefully uh, cajole some levers on the financial side to, um, to get that right. Now, of course, the interaction of those two for the regulated research industry, uh, they're just tightly interwound because mm -hmm. the financial incentive to a company developing a product is what's it going to take to get through the FDA. So you, you, you know, there's a lot that I think we can do to make it better. So on that topic, how is real world data being used right now in the regulatory process of decision making and how is that evolving in the short and medium term? Yeah, so I mean, what I would say is real-world data has always been used, and in fact, my career was built doing real-world data, global clinical trials in cardiovascular disease that were um, not using rarefied research mm -hmm. centers and all that sort of stuff. But I think just uh, recently, CDRH published 90 uses of real-world data that were involved in regulatory decisions. So, um, you know, just quickly, um, I think about, if we talk about the real world data part of it, you know, what I'd say is the traditional clinical trial data ecosystem is highly evolved. I'm not at all worried about that. It's too expensive uh, and all that kind of stuff, but it gets the job done for those kinds of studies. 
if we look at tranches of real world data, we've got um, the electronic health record, which is, I think, exponentially improving now in terms of quality of data and information. Um, we've got um, biosensors and data collected uh, from people's homes. Um, that's also moving along, um, I think, extremely quickly at this point. Um, and then uh, you've got the ethics of sharing information. I know there are a lot of data aggregators in this room, but most people don't know their data is being aggregated the way it's being done. And it's not necessarily serving patients very well. It's mostly used for business purposes mm -hmm. in the healthcare system. Mm -hmm. You could argue it makes the healthcare system more efficient, but it's not really directly accruing to the benefit of patients, I think, the way it should be. Um, and fundamentally, there's confusion, I think, about um, the ethics of data sharing that we need to straighten out. So mm -hmm. we're currently recruiting ethicists into the FDA. For, FDA's always had an ethics function, but sure. we're recruiting some well-known ethicists in to help um, articulate what the conditions should be for sharing data from a ethics perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, I think everybody in this room understands that, like, when I, if I have a heart attack right now, this is, my work was to say, you know, I'm gonna be better off because so much data was shared that my doctor's gonna know what to do. Mm. And um, the more people who understand that, and the better we set up the rules so that the data sharing accrues to the benefit of patients, the better off uh, we're gonna be. But there's also this whole thing about the methods to go from real world data to real world evidence, because all the real world data in the world is useless for our purposes unless the right study designs and methods are used. In other words, real world evidence does not mean crappy, stupid, retrospective, observational uh, reconstruction of information to try to draw a causal inference. Mm. Um, it means a, a well-designed exercise of doing a study that enables you to draw a causal inference with confidence. So let's talk a little bit more about that. What are some of the techniques that you see that are bridging that gap between data and evidence? Well, there's this one really brand new method that's uh, shockingly just revolutionary called randomization. <laughs> it's just amazing. Heard of it. Uh, as I like to say, God gave us randomization for a reason. And um, this has been, you know, in my work at Alphabet and other places, it's just a real education, I think, for a lot of people when they try to draw a causal inference and then compare it to what happens in a randomized study. And I'll just uh, say something real specific. I think the um, understanding of um, proper study design and adjusting for confounding has just zoomed and it's really getting better and better. But I want to emphasize proper study design there. You should, to draw a good causal inference, you should be able to reconstruct what would look like a randomized trial, mm -hmm. but it doesn't have randomization. Mm -hmm. But the issue which I think has not been solved at all is the time zero problem, mm -hmm. which is much more profound than people realize. There's a reason people get treated with a treatment. Very often it's because something is happening to them. And so if the people that got the treatment are in a state of change and the people that didn't get the treatment are mm. not, um, you are gonna end up, no matter how much adjustment you try to do, you're measuring their, their, their state of health at different points in time. Yes. And you can't fix that by any method I know of, of sort of standard adjustment. That's why very often good real world evidence studies will be in the context of a registry, for example, where mm -hmm there's a common point where something is triggered, like you have a cardiac procedure, right. in my case, or you had a, me a, a mental health event that caused you to seek um, counseling, and then you start at that point. What and about then, if the event is birth in the case of the NHS? Is that's that, a good one. Yeah. <laughs> birth is a good one. Yeah. Um, we need to do something about um, what's happening with births in, in the U.S. in multiple dimensions, but one of, you know, we're just outstripping the rest of the world in infant mortality right now, and it's just hard to accept. But anyway, that's a different 
story. Different, but related. So for sponsors who want to have a submission that incorporates real world data, what would you, what would you say to them? What are some of the best practices so that the data can actually be relied on, so that it's useful, so that we navigate the messiness? How does that work? Uh, plan. <laughs> And I'd say, right, you, you know, and too often we um, still end up with situations where people weren't planning, they have a messy data set and they try to fix it. And I just think <laughs> that's not, um, I, think, I think that can be very useful to generate hypotheses about what mm -hmm. to do next. But there are just so many examples now where a well-planned observational experience can be useful for multiple components of even the regulatory space that um, I think there's a lot of opportunity there. But, you know, interaction with the review groups um, early and as frequently as possible. And, you know, we're, uh, it was started, I know Amy Abernathy's here, she worked pretty hard on this, but within the different um, centers, there's increasing capability of uh, um, centralized groups that can give advice. Mm -hmm. But I also urge that people think really carefully about the beauty of um, doing clinical studies in the real world that use randomization, um, but actually study people who are in the context of the way the treatments are gonna be used. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, there are many situations where there's no choice. If it's heart attacks, you right. can't say, you know, you're having a heart attack, why don't you go to the research clinic and you know, we'll measure some things. You gotta do it in the context but we need to do that more often so that the results that we get are generalizable to the way the treatment's going to be used. And for some ears to perk up, you know, there's this little space between FDA approval of a product for an intended use and CMS deciding what it's going to do with it. Right. And we are having discussions with CMS about this. The Agilehelm situation brought that to a head. And I would just say it's a good thing that it came to a head because there's a lot of work to be done. Um, you know, what we need to know is not just is a treatment have benefits that exceed risks in one intended use in a hypothetical population <laughs> extracted into a research clinic. We need to know what's going to happen if people use it the way the label says it's going to be used compared to alternatives. A lot of that's not in the FDA lane, but you know the analogy I've used is a relay race. If FDA is running the first lap, we can't just drop the baton in the dark and expect <laughs> CMS to pick it up and figure out what to do. So I think there's a lot of enthusiasm for figuring out a better continuum. Doesn't change the FDA's fundamental mission, right. which is not finance and not cost, but. Um, there's no reason we have to make it impossible for CMS to know what to do in a $4.1 trillion <laughs> country spent uh, just health care alone, now five years shorter life expectancy than the average of high income countries, and China just passed us last week in life expectancy. I'm talking about the United States. China has a higher life expectancy now. And it's not because we're not innovating and creating new products, it's that because other countries are figuring out how to use the products better. And that's not FDA's primary lane, but we can't just ignore it. What do you think the, about the argument that, that the U.S. is bearing a disproportionate share of the investment cost for the whole planet in medical products? It, it is. Okay. Um, I don't think that's necessarily bad. That brings benefits. That doesn't mean we have to be stupid in knowing how to use the things that we invent. So the fact that we're investing more than any other country to me says, why don't we invest in figuring out which ones of these products are actually delivering value? Let's use those products more often and stop using the things that don't work. And by the way, it might even be good if we align the profit with the things that have the biggest impact on the health. Oh, uh, wow. <laughs> Could you imagine? So that? is that what you would do if you could fix the whole system? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, I'm, you know, I didn't invent that idea. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's been a quest been around. for <laughs> a long time. Yeah. But, you know, let's look at what's killing America. Why do we have a five-year shorter life expectancy? Mm -hmm. I mean, there are a lot of very broad social issues that um, the medical products industry shouldn't fix. But the 
but the medical pathways by which people meet their demise and loss of function in life are very well known. The, the big things that are changing now, uh, heart disease and stroke are going the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. Overdose of uh, opioids, we're losing more people from opioid overdose this year than from COVID now. Um, uh, tobacco use, 500,000 people die from tobacco use. And, um, are our health systems incentivized to actually uh, address those problems in a way that, and, and I would add in other chronic diseases, COPD mm. and mental health, which is a chronic disease resulting in um, suicide and uh, gun violence. Um, are our health systems and our medical products industries incentivized to directly tackle those issues in a way that um, brings down death and disability, I'd say probably not. Mm -hmm. um, do the incentives that the, our society very smartly put into place for cancer and rare disease have an impact on what's happened with those diseases? Hard to argue it hasn't. Cancer is about the only thing where things are going the right direction mm -hmm. right now. And we're having all these miraculous treatments for rare disease we didn't have before. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to go backwards in any of that. The question is, what do we do about these big causes of death and disability, which, is, which are the um, final manifestation of, admittedly, other issues that are not healthcare's direct issues so much, but which are very treatable and for which there are many targets that are not being attacked now because we haven't figured out how to create a pull through to get the industry to go in that direction. So what's driving cardiovascular disease in the wrong direction? Is it diet specifically, or is it many things? Um, it's, it starts with diet, lack of exercise, and tobacco. Um, and then you have inattention to blood pressure. Mm -hmm. um, the, our blood pressure um, success is going the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, related to diet is obesity, diabetes, and then it goes on from there. So these are bread and butter things that we have a lot of treatments for already. But we also know, um, if you look at the new obesity drugs now, now we'll see how it all plays out mm -hmm. with the data, but it looks like uncovering that neuroendocrine circuit between the brain and the gut may cause enormous benefits. Mm -hmm. um, so while I'm totally in sync with people that say, let's apply what we know mm -hmm. as a first priority, that is not to say that um, uh, innovation that leads to new treatments couldn't um, short circuit a lot of other things and lead to much better outcomes. And mm -hmm. I think um, because these are big diseases, they're gonna require big clinical trials yes. in the real world. They can't be yeah. done in research clinics at a $100,000 a patient. So let's talk a little bit about that. How do you see decentralized clinical trials, virtual traditionals, non-traditional trials in this landscape with these drugs and other drugs? Yeah, so first of all, let me say, um, <clears throat> we're currently organizing a uh, terminology of clinical research working group between the NIH and the FDA. Oh, uh, okay. Last Get time around, straight. it was biomarkers because I, it just drove all of us crazy that NIH was giving a lot of grants to people who said, I'm gonna, I've got this biomarker, it's gonna cure everything mm -hmm. under the sun, and not realizing that a biomarker that's associated with a disease is not the same as one that's a um, target that's gonna be associated with improvement and outcome given a treatment. So we did a joint exercise, which I think has made a difference to define those terms. And my general thinking is, at least in the U.S., if FDA and NIH agree on anything, it's likely to happen. And so <laughs> when people say, for example, real-world evidence or pragmatic clinical trials, they could mean almost anything mm. under the sun. So let's get the terminology um, right um, as a first step. And then I think, um, as I say, we've got to uh, figure out what levers need to be pulled to get everybody rowing in the same direction, and I want to put forward the idea that the number one issue right now is frontline clinicians in the U.S. are so under attack right now and so overwhelmed that they can't participate in research. And mm -hmm. so you might say, let's just circumvent all that with decentralized 
trials. But if you got a real disease, I think it's a real mistake to think you're just going to totally mm -hmm. bypass clinicians mm -hmm. because what, what you're going to have somebody in a clinical trial and then they're getting their medical care and the two are not, that just doesn't seem like a good way to <laughs> handle a chronic medical problem, for example. So I think we've got to look at it as a continuum, get the terms right, so that when we talk about what we're going to do, we all understand what we're trying to do and then align the system to get it done. And it ought to basically look like anything that can be done at home that yields equal or better information ought to be done at home. Mm. Anything that's going to get better information at a reasonable cost that needs that in a clinic ought to be done in a clinic. And whether that clinic ought to be the clinical care clinic or the research clinic then depends on another mm -hmm. gradation. But um, I think it is just intuitive, intuitively obvious, like in my field, if you want to know if a drug is helping someone exercise better, knowing what their activity is 24 by 7 at home, it's got to be better than coming into a research clinic every six weeks and doing a stress test. Sure. We have a lot of, uh, when I said tranches of data, we have a lot of work to do to get the data better and to get it organized and deal with missingness, mm -hmm. understand the role of artifact, um, reduce the number of publications that um, select good looking parts of the data and tout <laughs> how good it is and uh, have a lot more rigor in the, in the system. I hope that makes sense. That does, that makes sense. So we'll get the terminology straight then, but in that area, what are you most excited about of these different kinds of trials? I'm most excited about r randomization in the real world that allows one to make a causal inference about the effect of a treatment on outcomes that matter to patients. Now that's a lot. A yeah. lot in those. Uh, I'm sure every word's words. there for a reason, though. And I, you know, I mean, I, I am also, you know, I spent a lot of time in those early days of computers cleaning up data. I was the guy that would go into medical records <laughs> with a stack of charts and try to decipher the doctor's handwriting and right. put it into. And I think we are ready now to um, employ things like AI to really clean up the data and deal with missingness and know when you need to have every data item right and when you can approximate it by looking at multiple Synthetic parts data. of the data. Mm -hmm. Very excited about that. And I think having worked at Alphabet, I mean, you just told me you're now on the Alphabet board. I didn't yes. realize that. Congratulations. Thank you. You're in there with the big guys. No well. doubt about it. <laughs> um, people don't realize how much attention Alphabet pays to the fundamental data, to the, um, the provenance of the data and the incessant efforts to make sure it's clean to the right amount to draw a conclusion, and the degree to which protocols that engineers are required to go through for the precious part of Alphabet are looked at by a lot of people, so that when a business decision is made, it's made based on relatively high quality evidence with a lot of scrutiny of the methods that are used. Yes. So, there, you know, I think I learned a lot by watching that. I think people in healthcare tend to think you can just sort of take some messy data and figure it out. That's what Alphabet does. <sighs> um, that's not how its fundamental business is run, in my opinion. Not at all. Well, I spent most of my career in finance, and we cared a lot about yes. cleaning and curating the data because we were putting capital work based on the data, and you could make big mistakes with garbage in, garbage out. I have a couple of concluding questions. First in diversity or the representativeness of, of patients in trials, do you see any of these RWD techniques helping there? Um, I think it's, I'm going to answer this maybe in a way you're not expecting. Um, if you want diversity in your clinical trial, it's probably more effective to have a research clinic go out and recruit the uh, constituents that you want. Mm. But if you want to have diversity that represents the real world of diversity, including uh, the characteristics we often talk about, like race, sex, um, uh, gender, um, uh, ethnicity, but also rurality, which is one of the biggest issues now, mm. um, you're going to have a hard time filling up your big city research clinic with rural 
uh, patients, but that's where the biggest decline in our outcomes is occurring in this country now. Um, it's going to be better to use real world data, uh, virtuality, all those things. But here's where the problem has occurred so far, and maybe it's improved since I last looked at it. Mm -hmm. But one thing I can tell you for sure in, in helping to develop products on the Google side and the Verily side, the minute you have a virtual, a, a digital um, opportunity, who are going to be the first people to use it and to exploit it to the greatest advantage? It's going to be the highly educated, wealthy people. They're ready to go. So if you want these methods to actually lead to the conclusion that we're hoping for, you're going to have to consciously, um, thoughtfully prepare and uh, make the products look a little bit different mm. than the way they would look for a highly educated, wealthy person and test them out um, with the users to make sure they can be used. I'll, uh, just to give you one of my sales pitches to Congress, um, if you want to look at what I think would be an amazing source of uh, um, jobs for rural America, it's people to help um, elderly and rural constituents with less education deal with the digital opportunities that are going to occur now with the internet that's going to be available everywhere. Mm -hmm. And there's no better place for that than healthcare. Mm -hmm. um, you, know, I'm, you know, we started a, um, uh, a substance uh, disorder system in Dayton, Ohio, and one of the things that really struck me is if you live two and a half hours away in Ohio, which rural Ohio is where the um, opioid ep epidemic is most profound right now, if you're expecting that person to drive in once a week for a clinic visit, you're just out of your mind. Yeah. And um, I think the greatest benefit of digital uh, health care would be in rural populations, but you got to have a human being helping at the other end. It's not the same as sending you a message saying, let's have a, let's have a virtual visit. You're going to say, great, let's right. do it. Not going to happen that way in rural America. Well, I hope Congress buys that pitch. And my very last question is, what does evidence generation look like in 2050? Oh, I think hopefully we will have struck a deal societally that we all benefit by um, offering our healthcare data for everybody else's benefit. Which, by the way, most Americans already agree with that. They just don't get a chance to express it because the people who, who disagree um, are very effective in Mm. holding up the rest. We also have a set of rules that severely punish people that abuse that mm -hmm. capability. Um, and um, we go about our business every day getting, um, generating evidence by just living life. And uh, it's analyzed, oftentimes involving randomization, mm -hmm. like, um, should you get your, your uh, fourth shot or, uh, after you've had your third shot of, well, imagine if we had had a system that said, okay, well, we need a million people to be randomized and within six weeks we'll know what happens with infection. Yes. Within three months we'll absolutely know what happens with hospitalization and death. And then everyone can get whatever the right answer is. And um, I, I think we probably will get there. We'll have a lot of ups and downs. Because it's inevitable the way technology is um, evolving that that capability will, um, will be there. Uh, one plea to put in right now, um, and it came up in the hearing yesterday on monkeypox, people that know about data need to be proselytizing about two things. One is we cannot have our public health agencies trying to make decisions that affect the entire country as if they're driving down the road and the windshield has mud and crap all over it and there's no windshield yeah. wiper. I mean, who, the CDC has so much trouble just getting routine data because of the way our federation is put together. It, it's, uh, it's really detrimental to our country and people need to speak out about it. Um, why do we have to depend on, we had to depend on Israel to make our decision about the fourth COVID shot, because we couldn't get the data in the US in, in time. Um, the other thing is misinformation. 
We, we are losing the battle on misinformation. I think it's the leading cause of death in the United States. If you look at those common causes I talked about, yes. they're all being driven by um, bad things over the internet. Now you're on the alphabet board, so I feel especially important to tell you that you need to do more. You got plenty of money. I We're can tell aware. you I lived in the <laughs> so, um, But it's not just your responsibility. We need every person in this room to pay attention to their families yes. and their schools and to really be um, impatient about people who are spreading lies that are killing people. Not getting your updated vaccine is about the only way you're gonna die from COVID now. Right. Almost, almost no one has died who got both the updated vaccine and if they got infected, got Paxlovid if they were high risk. Yes. Almost no one. Yeah. And why are they not people not doing it? It's free. They're right. not doing it because someone's persuaded them Ugh. that they shouldn't. Thank you, Rob. Learned a lot. Fascinating as always. Great talking with you. Good luck on the board. Be well.